Good morning. It's a great day today. Even when we're facing problems. We want to celebrate this morning with Emily, Michaela, with Ruiha. And uh, is Cameron here? Yes. Cameron? Awesome. Because they're getting baptized later on. And that is just awesome. But today, we're talking about uh, sorting problems and um, getting out of the pit. How do I change the way I operate or function? So these are not just ordinary problems or any problems. So we're not talking about, uh, you know, what do I need to pick up from the grocery store? Or what do I um, need to... Or how do I solve a, a mathematical equation or a logistic problem or an organization problem? These are certain types of problems. These are when you need to get out of this pit. And so they are things that, you know, when you're stuck, when you've tried lots of things and it hasn't worked. And... Uh, when you know you need to do something differently or you need to change something inside. It's that sort of problem, to get out of the pit. That's what we're looking at. And here's the, here's the other thing. You know, no matter, no, matter what, no matter what level of responsibility you carry, no matter what lane you're in, no matter how young or how old you are, the thing is, somewhere along your journey, you're going to fall into a pit. You're going to get stuck. It happens to everyone. So it applies to everyone. To everyone. To you, me, everyone. No, it doesn't matter whether you're the, the leader of the most powerful nation on earth or you want to be the leader of the most powerful nation on earth. doesn't matter what level of responsibility you have, somewhere along the line, you're going to get stuck. It doesn't matter what lane you're in, whether you're the CEO of an organization, or whether you're the janitor, or whether you're the finance manager, or whether you're the accountant, or whether you're a clerk. No matter what lane you're in, somewhere along the, along the way on your journey, you're going to get stuck. And it doesn't matter how young or old you are, whether you're in the sand pit or in the mine pit, somewhere along the journey, you're going to get stuck. It happens to all of us. So it's a, it's a message that's, that's relevant to all of us. And so I want to look at three examples of people who got stuck. Examples from the Bible... They were stuck in a pit. Each of, these, each of these people, Joseph, so the Joseph I'm talking about is the Joseph who was the son of Jacob, not Joseph who was the father, um, who, who, uh, was the father of, who married Mary <laughs> and was the, the worldly father of Jesus. So I'm talking about the other Joseph who was the son of Jacob and had a whole lot of brothers. And we're also looking at the prophet Jeremiah, sometimes called the weeping prophet. And we're going to look at the prophet Daniel. Okay, because all, the, all these people were thrown into a pit. They were stuck in a pit. And if you look at them and you observe them, you will see some really important things that come out of their journey and their life beyond the pit that are actually very instructive and helpful for all of us. All right? So here we go. So here's the first one. Joseph. Now, Joseph was thrown into a pit by his brothers. There were a lot of them, and he was the second youngest. 
So they threw him into the pit because they were jealous of him. They were jealous of him. His father, or their father, favoured Joseph. And that's always a bad thing when there's more than one of you. <laughs> there are a lot more than one of them, and he deliberately favoured Joseph. And his brothers resented that, and they, they resented the fact that Joseph took advantage of that. And Joseph was only 17 years old, so he, was, he hadn't yet grown wisdom. He wasn't a wise young man at that stage. He had a lot to learn. And so one of the things he did one day was that he came out, spoke to his brothers, and said, hey guys, listen to this. I had a dream last night, and in my dream, we were all out in the fields, and we were cutting, harvesting wheat, and we would put our piles of wheat together and tie, tie them together. And that's how they did it, and they would stand them up. And all of you... You did that to your pile, and then all of your piles bowed down to my pile. What do you think that means? Now, you don't have to be a genius to know what that means. You're an idiot to say that to your older brothers. <laughs> but he couldn't help himself. See, he hadn't grown wisdom. So he says, what do you think that means? You know, you, you, you could imagine what his brothers thought, because they resented him. Resentment leads to bitterness, and bitterness is unfulfilled revenge. That's what bitterness is. And so that bitterness looks for an opportunity. They decided to find an opportunity, and they found it. So you can imagine their brothers thinking, yeah, I know what, I know what that means, Joseph. It means that Joseph needs a good slap. That's what that means. It means that we're going to get you, boy. We're going to get you. We're going to kick your astronomical dreams into the pit. That's what we're going to do, boy. We're going to get you. So that was Joseph. The next one was Jeremiah. Jeremiah was thrown into the pit by a lot of other leaders. He was thrown in there because... They were jealous of him, and they resented what he did because he was a person who was sent to speak to lots and lots of people and to lots of nations, not just his own people, but all the nations of all the countries surrounding theirs. And he would tell them, tell them things, prophesy over them. And everybody else from his country resented it from the nation of Israel. They resented it from the king downwards. And so some of those people decided they're going to do something about it. So they threw him into the pit. We're going to get you, boy. We're going to get you. Going to kick your astronomical prophecies into the pit. <laughs> That's what they're going to do, boy. And the next guy was Daniel. Daniel was an extraordinary person, extraordinarily wise, and he was resented by all the others, all of his peers, because he had great influence over the king, who was not a king like today, who was a king who was, had the power to do anything. And so they resented Daniel, and they decided, we're going to get you, boy. We're going to get you. Yep. We're going to kick your astronomical wisdom into the pit. We're going to get you. <laughs> yep, yep. So, those are the three stories in summary. Three men, each of them thrown into a pit. There's a common thing here. They're thrown in the pit because of jealousy. So, with these three men, 
Those things. The pit that they were thrown into, they couldn't get out of. It was impossible for them to get out by themselves. And the people that threw them there intended for them to die there. But here's the thing. God allowed that to happen. God allowed that to be part of their journey. As terrifying as it was, he knew that that was going to happen. And that was part of their learning. It was part of their journey. But here's the biggest thing. God had a different destiny for them. And that's the most important thing. And so what, we, what can we say from that is really this here. You know, sometimes getting stuck in a pit is part of our journey, but it's not our destiny. That's the most important thing. And your ability to change and navigate your way out of the pit is built on a foundation anchored in three things. What are those three things? You're knowing your true identity, discovering and pursuing your purpose, and believing your destiny. You can find that in Ephesians 1. Three things. Identity, purpose, destiny. And that's really the heart of what I want to talk about today. You see, that there is your rescue platform. That there is your safety harness. That there is your rope ladder out of the pit. And so that's why we want to look at it this morning. I tend to turn those things into a, a personal proclamation. And this proclamation is, whenever I get stuck on my journey, I must remember, this is not my destiny. And that's what you need to do. Remember, we all get stuck from some t- at some time. And when you get stuck, remind yourself, this is not my destiny. All right? Because I stand on a platform that is anchored in three things. My identity, my purpose, my destiny. Those three things. That's my rescue platform. That's my safety vest. That's my safety harness. That's my rope ladder out of here. All right? And that foundation is the thing that enables me to change on the inside and navigate on the outside. Your way out of being stuck in a pit. When you have that foundation, it means you can make changes on the inside and navigate on the outside. Your way out of the pit. Is that clear? All right. So, if you have a, you know, each of these men, you know, they were anchored in a strong identity. They pursued their purpose and grew in confidence as they went on in their purpose, as their journey progressed. And they believed their destiny was promised by God. So we want to have a look at those three things identity, purpose, destiny for each of those three people. And you'll see what I mean. So let's start with Joseph. So here's the thing. This was his identity. He knew I am different. He was different. It describes two dreams in in, in the Bible. Those are the only two it describes. You can be sure that he had lots of dreams and he understood them. You can be sure he understood them right from an early age. So he knew he was different. He knew he was favoured because his father showed it. He clearly showed it to him and gave him favour, which he didn't show his other sons. 
as unwise as that is, his son received it. He knew, I am favored. He knew, I am special. Even when he was thrown in the pit, he knew it was because he was special. When he was pulled out of there and sold into slavery, he knew he was special. When he was thrown into jail, he still knew he was special. People like Joseph, they know from a very early age that they're made for something else. They're on a journey. Their life doesn't begin and end here. They have a sense of purpose already built into them. And that was reinforced by his father. So what was his purpose? He had an extraordinary ability to generate wealth. He was sold into slavery, and he was bought by a wealthy person who was part of king, the king of Egypt's administration. He was sold into the house of Potiphar, and everything he touched in Potiphar's house turned to gold. He knew he was favoured. So he had the ability to, to create extraordinary wealth by his ability uh, to, with, with people and resources to multiply them. An extraordinary management of people and resources. And what was his destiny? It was this, to be the one who would rescue his father and his brothers. Why? Because they were the future heads of the nation of Israel. It doesn't necessarily say that as clearly as that, but you have to read all of those, Genesis 45 to 7 and Genesis 48, and you'll see it. That was his destiny. And receive a double inheritance. You will note that there's no tribe called Joseph, but there is a tribe called Ephraim, and there is a tribe called Manasseh his two sons. So he never got to have a tribe named after him, but his destiny was to save all of his brothers so that they would be the tribes, the heads of the tribes of Israel. And his two sons, two of his sons, would become the tribal leaders as well. That's double the, double the uh, inheritance. So, but here's the irony of the story. See, his brothers tried to end his journey in a pit. The irony is that God's destiny for him was to actually save his brothers so that one day they would be leaders of the tribes of Israel. And when you look at identity, it's exactly the opposite. The, de the destiny that God intended for him is exactly the opposite of what other people were trying to do to him. All right? This is not my destiny. When you get stuck in the pit, this is not my destiny. So let's have a look at Jeremiah. And you can read this in Jeremiah chapter 1. His strong identity I am set apart. I am a prophet to the nations. Now, Jeremiah didn't say that. Who said it? God said it. When God says something, that's truth. Jeremiah records it. He records it about himself. But he, he doesn't say, you know, I'm, you know, I'm set apart. I'm a prophet to the nations. God said it. What Jeremiah said was, but God, I'm only a child. That was his identity thought. I'm only a child. What did God say to him? He said, don't say you're a child. Right? He said, you are set apart. You are a prophet to the nations. What God says is more important than anything. And that's, that's really what you need to know. His clear purpose was this, to proclaim 
the destruction and building up of nations that would eventually lead to the kingdom, the kingdom of God. How? By going wherever God sends me and saying whatever God tells me. That's how God describes it to him in, in Jeremiah chapter 1. He says, I want you to go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. You are a prophet to the nations. You are set apart. Do what I say. Don't say, I am a child. Don't say that, Jeremiah. You are set apart. You are a prophet to the nations. You will do this. And you'll do it by just going where I tell you and saying what I, saying what I say to you. So, what was the sure destiny? You won't find that written anywhere in Jeremiah. You have to read the whole of Jeremiah. All 40-something chapters, I think it is. And you have to, before you get to that point, that says that, well, that's what his destiny is. He'd be the one who prophesy and witness the destruction of Jerusalem and experience the deep, deep sorrow and be rescued. God promised him this thing here. Wherever he was, whatever happened to him, he would rescue him. That was his destiny. But he would be the one who would prophesy, witness, and experience the deep, deep sorrow. Why do I say that? Because he was prophesying the destruction of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is God's city. God was telling him to talk about, to tell everybody that I'm going to destroy my own city. My own city. Jerusalem means the city of God. And if you ever get the opportunity one day to go to Jerusalem, it is an incredible experience. I didn't expect a city to impact me the way it did. I had no expectation of what I would experience in Jerusalem. But when you stand in that city, you experience what the kings and generals of armies around the world experience when they go to Jerusalem. There is no other city in the world has been attacked and taken over more than Jerusalem. The armies of the world have come to Jerusalem to conquer it. Why? Because it's got God's name on it. Because it's God's city. No other city in the world has been attacked as many times as Jerusalem. Because it has his name on it. And God was saying to Jeremiah, I'm going to destroy my own city. And he wanted somebody, one, to prophesy it, two, to witness it, and three, to experience it. He wanted a human to experience the deep, deep sorrow of the destruction of God's city. So that human, Jeremiah, would record it as such. And so in the future, every Israeli, every Jew would be able to read Jeremiah's words and know the heart of God and know the deep, deep sorrow that, that God feels for his city and for his people. That was his destiny. Okay, Daniel. He had a strong identity. I am chosen. How did he know that? Well, because he was. Because when Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem, and destroyed the city, he took a number of them back. And Daniel was, was part of that number. Therefore, he knew he was chosen to go somewhere else. He was not staying here. He was chosen to go somewhere else. I am set apart. When he got there, the, the king said, have a look at all these people that were brought across from Jerusalem and choose the best ones. Daniel was one of those. So he knows, I am chosen, I am set apart. And then he knows he's wise and discerning. Who said that? He didn't say that. Who said it? The king said it. The king, who is his natural enemy, said, this man is wise. This man is discerning. This is a guy that doesn't need anybody. But he says, this man here is wise, this man is discerning. Those weren't Daniel, Daniel's words, those are the king's words. So he knows that. He knows he's favoured. 
He knows he's favoured by God because God answers his prayers. That's his identity. Clear purpose? To be the most trusted advisor to the most powerful king on earth at that time. Right? And all the kings that he, all that person's successes. All the way to Darius. Okay. By revealing mysteries and solving impossible problems. That's how he got to be sitting beside in the, in the main room with the king and to be trusted by him. In a sure destiny, he'd be the one who reveals the key events for the end times. That's God's plan for the end of time. That was his destiny. And it says on the very, very last sentence of the book of Daniel, it says, rise again to receive my inheritance. That was his destiny. Okay, so look. Here's the key thing. When we are born again, we receive a new identity and a greater destiny. If you're born again, you receive a new identity and a greater destiny. And our identity is based on who God says we are. Right? And God says these things. God says all those things and a whole lot more. A whole lot more. I haven't got verses here because you, you just look them up. Just go on the net and say who God says I am. You'll find all the verses. You'll find all these things and a whole lot more. Study them. Because that's God speaking. That's what God says you are. All right? Okay. Despite God saying all these things about who you are and a whole lot more, most people in this room don't fully believe it. You don't fully believe it. There are very few people who grasp all that and say, that's who I am. Because up here and in here, there are some strongholds. And that's what I want to talk about. The strongholds of false belief. What are these? Well, our identity is often distorted by false beliefs we have stuck in our minds and in our being, really. We call them strongholds. We call these things strongholds, all right? And here's the other thing. Strongholds are usually created by bad experiences and repeated and reinforced by what other people say about us. You have a bad experience and you have another bad experience and it builds up, it works inside you. And somebody says, makes a comment on that and that makes it deeper. It makes it stronger. It makes its presence greater in your life. It becomes part of your identity. That's who I am. So, when we turn to God, we have to pull down those old strongholds and replace them with new fortresses. Amen. All right? So, let's have a look at that. I want to give you some examples. On the left-hand side here, on the left-hand column, I'm going to put up a whole lot of strongholds that are, that are reasonably typical. Then in the middle column, I've got life expectation. So you have a stronghold. How does that affect your life expectation? And then how does that lead to your destiny? The overall message is stronghold, identity, destiny, connection. There is a connection, there's a pathway that goes through our life expectation that leads us to our destiny. Identity leads to destiny. All right? So let's have a look at some of these, and I'm just going to go through them quickly. 
If you believe you're a loser because you've been told you're a loser because you've lost a couple of times and then you start to believe it yourself and, and people then start calling you a loser, then you say, I'm a loser. What's my life expectation? I will never succeed. What's my destiny? Frustration and poverty or something like that. If you say, I am bad, and you believe it, what's your life expectation? I will never be forgiven. Not even God can forgive me. That's what you think. What's your destiny? Unforgiven and sorrowful. Forever. If you think, I am worthless, what's your life expectation? I will never be valued. Nobody will ever think anything of me. What's my destiny? Rejected and alone. If you think I am cursed, what's my life expectation? I will never have peace. I will never, I will never, I will never. What's my destiny? Tormented and damned. If you think I am trapped, my life expectation is I will never be free. I will never, ever be free. What's my destiny? Darkness and despair. It's a pretty horrible place. If you think I'm a victim, your life expectation is I will be abused. In fact, you think it's my right to be abused. If you think I'm a victim, suffering and sorrow is my destiny. If you think I am weak willed, if that's your identity, your life expectation, I'll always give up. I'll get to a certain point and then I'll give, give up. I'll get to a certain point and then that voice will talk to me and says, hey, you're weak-willed. You're not supposed to be here. Get back down there. That's how it works. Your destiny is unfulfilled and hopeless. If your identity is I am addicted, I will abuse. I will abuse, abuse either myself or I will abuse others. No matter what your addiction is, it doesn't matter. It's the same, same thing. You will abuse. You will abuse either yourself or others, and or others. And the destiny is tormented and damned. Now look, these are the things, and there's a whole, I go through lots and lots of strongholds, but the, but the point is, stronghold of identity leads to destiny. That's the connection. But you know these things here, these strongholds here, they are, th they are the things that really tip people over the edge and into the pit, right? They're cumulative. They add up. And every time you have another failure or slip-up, it reinforces the identity. It deepens this track here, and it confirms the destiny. Every time one of these things happens, those are the things that tip you over the edge and into the pit. These are the things that in the extreme will cause people to take their own lives. Because they see no way out. It tips them into a pit into a pit that is deep, that is dark, that is cold, that is alone. And totally hopeless. When a person loses all hope, they're gone. They see no escape. That's why they call them strongholds. Because they don't break. They break you. That's what a stronghold does. That's why it's called a stronghold. It doesn't move. It stays there. It says, I belong here. They don't break. They break you. But God has called you to a higher destiny. God has called you to a higher destiny. There's another way of looking at this. That there is a map. 
We call it an identity map. It starts on the left-hand side down the bottom and ends up in the destiny up in the top right-hand corner. So, for many of us, we have, we have these strongholds all over our identity. It might be one, it might be two, it might be many. And those strongholds, they lead us to a destiny, to a lower destiny. Okay? So, go back to the map. And what we want are fortresses, new fortresses. We want to destroy those old strongholds and rebuild in their place a fortress in place of every stronghold with a fortress. Okay? So, here's some, here's some strongholds. Loser. Angry. Liar. Bad. Stupid. Hurt. Cursed. Abuser. Failure. Unfaithful. Ugly. Weak world. Not good enough. Victim. Rejected. Those are strongholds that people might have in their minds. There's maybe lots of others. We want to be able to destroy those and replace them with fortresses. Yep. So here's some examples of, fort of fortresses that we want to replace them with. So these fortresses of our identity lead us to our intended destiny. So, instead of a loser, I'm a winner. I was born to win. I will win. I'm not angry. I am calm. I'm not un untruthful. I'm not a liar. I'm truthful. I'm forgiven. I'm wise. I'm not stupid. God made me wise. I asked God to make me wise. He made me wise. I'm successful. I'm healed. I'm not wounded anymore. I'm not hurt anymore. I'm healed. I'm not cursed. I am blessed. I'm generous. I'm not an abuser. I'm generous. I am faithful. I'm beautiful. I'm not ugly. I'm beautiful. God made me. I'm beautiful. I'm steadfast. I'm not weak world. I'm steadfast. I will get through this. I am accepted. I am not rejected. I am sec accepted. I am fulfilled. I am favored. Those are the fortresses that we, re that we build in place of the strongholds that we remove. If you remove a stronghold, you have to replace it with a fortress. But here's the thing, if you want to reach your destiny, then fulfill your purpose. You fulfill your purpose by pursuing your purpose. Yari spoke about purpose a couple of weeks ago. You can go back and look at those things. You fulfill your purpose by pursuing your purpose based on your true identity. Your true identity. But if your identity is screwed up, then you'll end up following a purpose that you are not designed for. And you'll end up going on missions that you're never called to. And you'll end up fighting battles that you're not equipped for. Not designed for, not called to, not equipped for. And if that's what you do, then the result is tragedy. The result is inevitable. But God called you to a higher destiny. Those things there, that's your, that's your identity. You are anointed for your identity, your purpose, and your destiny. I want to go back 
to removing strongholds. See, strongholds don't leave voluntarily. You have to break them and remove them spiritually because they have a spiritual root. You can't break them by positive self-talk alone. Okay? It's a spiritual exercise. And that's what we're going to do now. So, up there are some of the strongholds that we talked about before. And there are lots of other strongholds in people's identities. Those are just some examples. And so, what we're going to do is a spiritual exercise. And I want you to look at that screen. And if you can identify any of those strongholds that are your strongholds, then we're going to do an exercise now to actually break those strongholds. You know, if you can see any of those things on there, then in here, that's how you think of yourself. or you struggle with it, then we want to take you through an exercise to break it. Let me read this out to you. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 4. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So, if you've been born again, if you have Jesus in your life, then we can do this right now. And that's what we'll do. If you don't have Jesus in your life, we can show you the way here right this morning. You can even join the others in the baptism, which we're going to start in about a couple of minutes. So for those of you who are being baptized, if you want to start to get ready, please. So how do we do this? If you look at the screen... And you can identify with any one of these strongholds or other strongholds that God has made you aware of. Just put your hand up like this. That includes me. It's a simple exercise. I'm going to read that verse out again for those two verses. Then I'm going to lead us. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So if you, and we all have strongholds, they may not be the ones up there. So everyone can participate in this. So you just repeat after me. Based on your word, just spoken, Lord, and on who you say I am, I break the strongholds over my life and in my identity by the power and authority of Jesus Christ. So let it be said. So let it be done. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're going to have some baptisms now. And uh, I want to repeat the invitation. If you don't know Jesus Christ, if Jesus is not in your life, then we uh, can do something about that this morning and would love to do that. 
there will be people here that are available and can help you work through that. But in the meantime, baptisms.